Hey, how you doing? Thanks for downloading Garden Fork Radio. Welcome. This is me, Eric. I am your host. I have a YouTube channel also called Garden Fork. This is eclectic, haphazard, whatever comes out of Eric's brain. And today, Will Wallace's brain from the Weekend Homestead. Welcome, sir. How you doing, buddy? I have no complaints. Awesome. We wanted to talk today um, about what you can do while you're stuck at home. And Will typed up this gigantor list. So I once again, I don't have to do any work. <laughs> I can just comment on whatever Will's going to say. So we hope you guys are doing all right. I'm getting a little twitchy being at home. And this is actually kind of very inspiring for me, the list that you just sent me. So should we just, oh, I wanted to thank, um, I have, th we have three new patrons uh, of Garden Fork. They will be getting the uh, bonus after show. And we just actually, the pre-show and the after show now, I'm putting on our Patreon feed, which you can add into your podcast player. I want to thank Greg G, John D, and Tom. So thank you very much there. That's super neat. It's it's so cool to see the community grow and just see people interacting with this stuff. I'm I'm guessing the pre-show after show thing that you've been posting. How has that been um, taken by the patrons? Are they liking it? I haven't gotten any hate mail, so perfect. <laughs> that's, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a win in my book. Well, like, see, like I I get a million emails a day, and I'm looking at my inbox right now, and there's one. It says, Greg, and special thanks. And I have the email inbox set up not to show a truncated sentences or anything. And that could be spam. I get a lot of very compelling spam, and they want me to click on something. Um, so I, I'm like, is that a thank you from a viewer, or is that spam? So... I I'll, think we should just we I think we should just have everybody email radio at gardenfork.tv and say hey to Eric, you know, <laughs> then we can fill his inbox with that kind of stuff. Not spam. Of spam. Not, I'm going to change the list preview and see what it does here. Um I will tell you this, the part that amazes me is oh, it's I a don't good get one. a Oh, it is. Do you want to read it or do you want to proofread it first? No, I'm going to read it right here. Oh, and it's from one of my patrons. Just wanted to say a quick thanks for sharing what you and your friends do. I've been listening for years and really love listening to the trials and tribulations that you go through because I can really relate. Loving the podcasts you do while walking. Oh, I do that for the patrons. Um, it's I call it the either the city walk or the woods walk. I just talk into my phone. Uh, for some reason, the free-flowing thoughts are very refreshing. Yikes. <laughs> That's my comment. Uh, maybe it's the fresh air. Keep up the good work. That's from Greg, one of our patrons. Well, thank you, Greg. That's awesome. Yeah. So we have 15 things you could do while stuck at home. And I actually am stuck at home today. And um, I I kind of sort of did a couple of these. So why don't you start off, sir? Well, you know, one of those items is that's on the top of the list, which no one will be surprised with because every year I harp on it, especially on the podcast or on my on my own blog, is testing your smoke detectors and your CO detector. It's actually a really good time, especially if you're opening up your house to vacuum them out and clean them out and do those types of things. And it's, it's something you should do regularly because, to be honest with you, smoke detectors save lives. I mean, it's the fire department in me that brings that up. But it's one of those things that's probably one of the easiest things to do, get some 9-volt batteries and just change them out. Yeah, and the other thing is, we'll talk about this in a future episode, but um, we've been saving our pennies for years, and we finally could afford uh, air conditioning in our apartment, and they had to um, drill through brick walls. This was way above my pay grade, so we had to hire people to do it. And the dust was so, that brick dust is so fine, it got everywhere, it got into our smoke detectors and set them off. Wow. So what I did was I took them outside and they're those 10 year ones where you, you can't just disconnect the battery. Uh, you can hit the off, you can hit the suspend button. I think it's called, but I blew them out. I have what's called a pancake air compressor. It's for a Brad nailer. And I, j I looked it up and it said, right in the instructions for the smoke alarms, just blow it out with some, with some canned air, compressed air. And I blew them out and I put them back on their mounting plate and it automatically turns it back on again and they worked fine. So vacuuming them while they're in position would not be a bad idea. 
Yeah. And if you don't have a pancake compressor, I mean, for a couple dollars, I think even at like some of the dollar stores, they sell little cans of compressed air. You don't need very much to do it. I mean, just a couple of shots in there and it uh, it'll make the difference. And where you'll thank yourself more than anything is you won't be sleeping in bed at three o'clock in the morning and all of your smoke detectors go off and then in your house and you're trying to figure out what's going on. It's a lot easier to do it in the middle of the afternoon when it's nice and, you know, you can get on a ladder and take care of it the right way. My friend has the Google Nest smoke alarms, and uh, when one goes off, they all go off, and it's a little heart-stopping. Does it send an email also? I've heard that those <laughs> new ones send emails and text messages and everything, so it's not just your smoke detectors going off. Your phone is beeping, and your laptop is chirping and everything else, too. Wow. Um, I don't know. He is he's a, has a wired home, and I purposely have an unwired home, so... I will say we talk about the dollar store. Uh, the dollar store near me has incredibly good dark chocolate. For a, it's really good. It's only a dollar. <laughs> that is very odd to come up with, but I could see it. <laughs> so uh, what's what's the next one, sir? Let's let's move down the list. Actually, this one goes right up uh, the alley of what Eric does, which is maybe get a couple gallons of paint and and brushes and paint a room in your house. You know, there's everybody's always got that one room that. They haven't gotten to or whatever. Maybe it's a good time to, you know, give that a try. Nice thing is, is with the weather getting nicer, you can open your windows to air out the house so you don't get that smell. And it's a good project to do to think about stuff or listen to music or maybe a podcast or something like that. And, you know, do some painting and you can really freshen up your house with a coat of paint. It's not that expensive and almost anybody can do it. Exactly. I have a couple of tips here. Uh, if your walls, if it's if it's the kitchen or near the kitchen, you should wash the walls. Or if somebody who's a smoker is in that room or in your house or you haven't painted it in like 10 or 15 years, I would wash the walls. And I would use, um, it's called TSP-free. It's a trisodium phosphate uh, alternative. It's uh, TSP, trisodium phosphate, is a great cleaner but the TSP free is a safer one on your skin. So, and you literally you sponge the walls down, and then uh, do a clean sponge with just some water. Don't it's not dripping wet, and the better adhesion you have from the old paint to the new paint, the longer it's going to last and the better it's going to look. Perfect. And if it's a color change, a dramatic color change, I would prime it. And I would tint the primer with the new top coat color. So if it's an orange and you're going to an off-white, I would use what's called a blocking primer. And, uh, well, it's already white, so yeah. But think about that because colors can bleed, like reds and blues and oranges can bleed through just a generic primer. And you get what you pay for with paint. So think about that. Let me ask you the one question about painting that I had, which was, do all those new fancy tapes that they have on the market really work or do you just buy the cheapest stuff? What do you mask things off with? Oh, you get what you pay for with painting tape. Yeah, the the knockoff, the blue tape, I think is by 3M. And if you buy, the, I've bought the knockoff paint in some uh, mom and pop Brooklyn hardware stores and it is junk. It, it tears, it won't, It you know, when you're unrolling blue tape or masking tape but it, it sometimes tears weird and you can't get the rolls started again and i mean it's nine dollars a roll but it'll save you in time and you know what's your time worth you know exactly number three on the list take down your christmas lights and maybe clean out your gutters while you're up there i know a lot of people wait till july or june to take down the christmas lights but you know with the weather being seasonably warmer you know it could be a good time to do that and then the other thing is before the rainy seasons really start, having your gutters cleaned out can definitely save you on having any issues in your basements or any of that type of stuff with water. Yeah, I don't understand the Christmas light thing, um, especially the ones that are supposed to look like icicles, because during the day it just looks like white wire with little clear bulbs on them and they're hanging from your gutter or whatever, and they, they look horrible. <laughs> so... It's radio at gardenfork.tv for the complaints on that one. <laughs> and um, cleaning out your gutters, we actually got new gutters on our house a while ago, and I opted for the um, leaf guards on them. And I went with a local guy who does – he has his own gutter company with the um, 
it's a one piece gutter. It comes out of the trailer. It's got a trailer with a little machine in it. And it, it basically forms the gutter right there out of a roll of metal. So there's no, there's no seam. It's seamless gutters. That's what that's called. And before he brought his gear over, he said, I'm going to stop by your house and see what kind of trees are in your yard and what kind of material is in your gutters now. So I'll bring the right gutter guard. A gutter guard, I think is a trade name, uh, but it's what kind of screening he was going to bring. And he, and it's worked great. So I will say too, on the gutter guard thing, if you ever wanted to consider doing that, we went to one of the home improvement stores and they have these, um, you know, they're either 36 or 48 inch uh, plastic snap on gutter guards. Yeah. And I was really concerned that they wouldn't work very well. So we had a, a property where we needed to put those put something on there to kind of protect it. And I thought, well, let's just try this for temporary till we can get around to actually replacing the gutters. Surprisingly enough, four years later, those gutter guards are still up there. It was very simple. They snapped onto the gutters and slid underneath the, the drip edge shingle area and a couple zip ties. And we had it done really quickly. And I think all said and done, we spent maybe $60. So if you think about how much time and energy you spend on going on the ladder, cleaning off your gutters and all that kind of stuff, if there's small areas where you need it, that is something to consider. And the best part about it is with a straight edge razor, you can cut it so you can make it any shape or size that you need. So you don't have to have any fancy equipment to do it either. Neat. One caveat, um, most zip ties are not UV stable. And so being out in the elements, they might deteriorate. Um, and then your gutter guards might become disconnected. Good point. Yeah. Maybe some stainless steel wire instead. That works. You know what just popped into my head? We're talking about the Garden Fork uh, patrons. Uh, Scott, who's also a agronomist, uh, has been wanting to be on the show. And I am horrible at emailing people back, as Will knows. So, um, Scott, I owe you an email. In my defense, Scott went on vacation for a week, and I tried to email him, and he wasn't there. How and, dare and I he called him? I called him by my other friend's name by accident. <laughs> Yikes. Let's move on to number four. It's an easy one. How about clean out your refrigerator and defrost your freezer? I just did that you know. today. You know, one of the things you can do, and I have this later in the list and we can just throw it in there, is, you know, vacuum out the compressor on your refrigerator too because there's a lot of dust and dirt that builds up in there and it hampers the ability for your refrigerator freezer to operate. And, you know, if you have the canned air out already do your smoke detectors, you can just use it back there with your vacuum and it does make a difference on your freezer and refrigerator. Yes, and there is a coil either on the back of the fridge or in the bottom of the fridge, part of the condenser. And if that's full of dust, it doesn't run nearly as well and your electric bill goes higher. Exactly. They make a you can if you can't get your vacuum in there, you can get a Swiffer, like a Swiffer or a feather duster in there and knock the dust off and then try and cram a vacuum with one of the dust nozzles in there as well i actually cleaned out the uh refrigerator because we uh um i went to the grocery store and they had food today which was unusual so i bought a lot of it and then i was like what is all this stuff that's in the refrigerator and it's it's like half o half open half empty jars of some ar arcane condiment that someone brought for a dinner four years ago and you're like oh so um a lot of things went in the compost. I take all the food, I put it in the compost, and I wash out all the jars, and I put them in the recycle. It's very important, actually, to wash your plastic and glass in that before you put it in your recycle, because if it's dirty, uh, they won't take it. Well, even further than that is if you have glass or recyclables that you don't wash out, a lot of recycling facilities do hand sorts, and then all of those individuals have to deal with whatever is left over in those containers as they go down the conveyor belt for the sort. So some areas of the country have these sort mechanisms where people actually physically sort this stuff. And if it's not clean, you end up in a situation where all of that is getting all mixed together and then someone else has to deal with doing it and, and, and messing around with it. Take two minutes to rinse it out and then recycle it. it makes all the difference for somebody else down the road. Right. It doesn't contaminate the other clean plastic that is on that um, conveyor belt thing. Yep. Yeah, I feel much better. Uh, I found some stuff at the bottom of the fridge that um, it took a long time with soaking and, and Windex to get off the plastic. And I'm like, what is at the bottom of the fridge? 
Well, kind of going along the same lines, the fifth item on the list is clean out your pantry and maybe toss out some old spices and seasonings you have. You know, I've had many of recipes where I've made something and you had to buy one specific thing for it. We ended up not making it again. And I actually found some things that I've had for five or six years in the back of my pantry that I didn't even realize was still in there. So, you know, that's something that you can also go through and clean up. Yeah, I um, I think spices last six months at most. And I'm big on, I go to the local, um, like Indian, Bangladeshi, Pakistani uh, spice store. And then I put them in... Uh, little zipper lock sandwich bags. And I think they last much longer that way. We've actually purchased some of the um, bigger containers of spices. And then we have a vacuum sealer and put the, the spices or whatever it is inside of there, like in their jar inside of that container and then vacuum seal it and then throw it in a box. And we've actually seen some really good shelf life out of, of some of the items that we've done that way. Oh, yeah. I also think you should simplify your spices. I mean, I have... Cumin, coriander, garam masala, uh, a, a nice curry powder that I like, um, some red pepper flakes, a chili powder, and that's about it. I mean, I, I, I lean more toward curries and oh, I have some oregano, like an Italian seasoning mix, but um, I don't think you got to make it all complicated. I think kind of a base set is uh, more economical, but that's just my world. So. Well, the neat thing, too, is, is if you do have spices in your cabinet, one thing we've kind of done recently is you type it into Google and all of a sudden some recipes pop up using that. And then instead of throwing it out, you just use it up. Yeah. And if you don't use it, um, put it in your compost. Absolutely. We talked about this next one on a previous show, but I thought I'd put it back in there, which is, you know, go through your house and clean out your basement and your garage and find things to donate to people. Yes, that's on. T that's tomorrow for me. <laughs> I might so make you're a gonna, video about it. <laughs> are you going to donate that uh, rolling tool cart you made? No, that's great. That's one of my biggest viewers uh, lately. Biggest viewers. That that has gotten uh, a lot of interest. And the follow-up one as well. So it's kind of heartening because people have, at, have posted even more ideas. So I might have to make a third tool cart video. It's amazing to see if you type in tool cart hacks or if you even just follow any of those groups on Facebook or anything like that, the, the ideas that people come up with with these things to make, you know, a lot of these folks are doing it for their jobs and things like that. So if they work in a shop, all the little corners that they kind of put together or different ways that they store spray paint cans or mount different things to the outside of it to make their job easier to do can also be easily done at your house to make the things you do around your house a lot easier. Yeah, one, one gentleman in the comments works at an aircraft factory, and he has a tool cart that he has to roll around uh, a very large warehouse. So I was like, I want a picture of that one. <laughs> they, they actually have, there's a group online that's like, show me your tool cart or show me your tools. And you get to see all the different tools that people have that they use, you know, not screwdrivers and hammers and that kind of stuff, but like the very specific tools that they use for like engine repair on an airplane or something along those lines where you would never see this outside of that, but it's kind of cool to learn how people use tools and what is made to, you know, solve problems when you're trying to fix things. Yeah. Mine, uh, my rolling tool cart had two chainsaws on it this morning. Cause there, um, I was cutting, uh, trees that fell on the trail and they both bogged down on the high end. Like when they warm up, when, you know, you, you start a chainsaw, you let it warm up for a bit. And then when you're starting to cut like five minutes in, um, my steel, my big saw on the high end, it just dies. And then if I let it cool off a little bit and start it up again, it'll run. But then when it gets running again nicely, it dies. So I got to figure out what's wrong with that. Moving on to the next one, caulk your shower. You have a shower in your house that either is leaking a little around the door or has kind of that moldy look. It To get a uh, razor blade and a scraper to scrape that out of there and then put a nice new bead of caulk in there really freshens up a bathroom. And it's something that almost anybody could do. It's fairly straightforward and simple. The key there is to get as much of the old caulk off as possible. And they have new brands of caulk out that have uh, anti-mold properties built into them. Because your, your caulk looks has those little black specks on it. it that's, it's mold from being in a bathtub or, or a shower. Yep. My thought was, um, which went straight out of my head. Oh, don't cheap out and buy cheap 
bathtub caulk. Buy the high quality stuff that has the mold inhibitor in it. It'll it'll save you from having to pull that stuff out in a couple of years. Well, the other thing too is the difference between the cheap stuff and the expensive stuff is not really that much different. It's not like, hey, this is three dollars and this is thirty dollars. It's like, hey, this is three dollars or this is eight dollars. So, I mean, looking at the projects and things like that, it's one of those things where. If you cut the corner on that one, one, you could have water leaking in your shower and then all of a sudden now you're fixing tile or floor or something along those lines versus, you know, spending a little extra on the caulk and spending a little more time on it. It'll last you longer and it could save you from having other problems. The other thought I have is to buy splurge on a really nice caulk gun. It is it is a world of difference from the dollar store caulk gun. I will say this, that that's probably one of my weaknesses is I... Like if we have to do it on a window or something like that, I can do it there. But somewhere where it's really visible, I usually have Todd or Matt work on those types of things because I just don't have the patience for it. And it just turns out bad. I get it everywhere. I'll put my hand in it. Then I'll put my hand on the wall or on the shower door. And now I'm tracking it all over the house and I have a half hour of cleanup afterwards. So the the higher end caulk guns, when you let off on the trigger, the the rod that's pushing the caulk out of the tube backs off just a little bit and so the caulk stops flowing out the tip that right there was worth the price of admission folks there you go i didn't even know they had that i let you behind the door here yeah I let you behind the curtain hey would you like more of garden fork or more of eric would you like to get it in your email inbox I send out, just about every week, I send out a little email about Eric's world and new stuff I posted. I even talk about podcasts I've listened to or just interesting stuff. And usually, almost always, at least one picture of the Labradors, Henry and Charlie. You can get that by signing up for Eric's Garden Fork email newsletter thing. There should be a link in the notes to this show. Just scroll down to the description of the podcast in your app and I hope it's a clickable link it should be or go to gardenfork.tv and on almost every page at the top of the page should be a sign up if you're on a mobile device you might have to tap on the little there's a little menu bar and then hopefully there it'll be a sign up or scroll the bottom of a post and you can sign up there should be a link in the app here more of Eric It would be fun to have you along for the ride. It's kind of more brain dump, Eric. Cool stuff. All right. All right, let's go on to the next one. This one, I know that you have a bajillion videos on that people can go and look at. But if you're at home with your kids or you're at home by yourself, start seeds. You know, do some seed starting, have some plants going, that kind of thing is a good weekend or afternoon project if you're around the house and you have time. Also, Aaron from the Weekend Homestead has some excellent videos on seeds. And uh, she just posted one where she it's kind of a overview, but she's down in her basement and she's kind of making fun of how it looks like a house of horrors. And I don't think it does. I think it looks like a, a place where she's growing stuff. But um couple of key things. Don't overwater your seeds. I think that's the biggest cause of failure. And they need more light than you think. Uh, Putting them in a window, you're just going to make them what are called leggy because they're going to keep trying to grow to the window. I have some videos about making some inexpensive grow lights. And um, if you go to the Costco sells an LED shop light, it's usually on sale for $19.00. Uh, and just put that smack on top of your seedling tray. That'll help a lot. One correction. It's Aaron from the Impatient Gardener. I'm Will from the Weekend Homestead. See, well, this explains from my patron Scott is why I messed up his name in the last email. Which It's okay. <laughs> so. Hi, Aaron. Hope everything's good. She Actually, we just heard from her. She's going to be on the show, but she is slammed. Uh, much like a lot of people, uh, the camera operator worked uh, remotely about 14 hours yesterday. So it was pretty crazy. It has. I mean, we've tried to set this up and it's been just trying to get everything lined up is, is always tricky, but you know, we made it work. Yeah. All right. What's next? 
All right, how about this one? Vacuum out the bugs out of your lights, change your furnace filter, and clean up your, basically around your utility area, like around your water heater and around your furnace, you know, that type of area. Oh, totally. Yeah, if you can uh, clean that out, everything, the furnace runs much more efficiently. That, and in, in, for a lot of folks in the United States, this is kind of that season when your furnace isn't running very often. You know, in the middle of summer, the air conditioning is running, so your furnace is running. In the middle of winter, your heat is running. But in the summer and the fall, you usually, or the spring and the fall, you usually have a couple days where it doesn't run at all, so it's a good time to go through and change those filters and make sure everything's there because if you don't change your furnace filter, which I think I've told the story many of times where at the resort, the furnace wasn't running very well and there was a furnace filter in there. So I pulled it out and then I looked inside and there was another furnace filter on top of that one. So I pulled that one out and then I looked inside and there was another one. So somebody <laughs> didn't realize the furnace filters were falling down and they had three of them on top of each other. And I don't want to say they were the same color as a black sweatshirt from the garden fork website, but it was pretty close. So it makes your furnace work really hard. We changed that out and it's amazing how much more efficient the equipment is over at the resort. You're like, Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I couldn't figure out why it was running all the time, and we didn't have that. And so we started kind of working through the troubleshooting on it. And I was like, oh, there's no furnace filter in here. So I was going to put one in until I kind of got in there with a flashlight. And that's when I realized I saw one. I'm like, oh, there's only one in here. And then I started pulling them out, and there was actually three of them. So, Oops. <laughs> At that point in time, it kind of made itself a HEPA filter, if you've ever seen those really thick ones. Oh, yes. Also, um, if you have forced air air conditioning, there is a coil – in the furnace somewhere and you can clean that as well. That sometimes takes a professional, but you could at least hit the top of it and the bottom of it with a shop vac um, just to get the dust off of there would be very helpful. One important thing about your furnace, especially if you're working on it or cleaning anything out, there's usually a light switch on a box that's attached to the side of your furnace, or you can go over to your breaker and your furnace is normally on its own circuit in your breaker. Make sure that that's turned off before you start reaching your hands inside there. There should be safety mechanisms to make it so the furnace doesn't run while it's open, but as an extra precaution, either flip that switch or hit your breaker to make sure that nothing happens while you're working on it to keep yourself safe. Yeah, is it unplugged? <laughs> it's a big deal. Oh, yeah. Okay, next one, sir. Uh, this one is uh, Better Yourself. There's Today, um, there's thousands of online courses and companies that are offering their classes at reduced rates or even free. So whether you need to find educational stuff for the kids or you want to do something to better yourself, the, besides the mountain of stuff online and on YouTube and in podcasts, there's a lot of companies that have professional educational stuff that's now at exceptionally reduced uh, discounts. So my local library closed and they sent out an email and one of the things they mentioned was that they have a uh, subscription to the Great Courses um, library of online classes. And the Great Courses, I've, I've heard them advertised on podcasts, I've seen them advertised in uh, the New York Times. And these are like Harvard ranking professors and experts teaching I think they're like college level classes or, and I'm like, Oh my God, I, I gotta go. I gotta go find out about that. So through your library, you may have access to really cool stuff. The other thing I have access to through the library is using an app called Flipster. I can read a ton of print magazines on my iPad. There's uh, uh, food and wine. There's Bon Appetit. There's time magazine. There's some, People Magazine, I had to read the People Magazine and see what was going on with um, the monarchy, you know, the one the one kids moving to Canada, you know, and they write very compelling headlines. So, but yeah, you could, you can take an online class and, and for free. So go to your library's website and see what online media they offer. Also, my library offers two different kind of artisan, uh, you know, kind of, art film they're like they're like they're like netflix but they have art artist movies and that might you are documentaries and you might find that as well but go to your library's website and see what they offer it's kind of amazing actually to kind of go to the other side of it if you have kids in the house i know that i've preached for many years let get the kids off the devices and get them outside but one of the things that you can do is you know if you have to 
um, spend time with the kids inside for whatever reason you can't go out. Uh, I think it's like Scholastica and some of the other scholar um, companies that make the documents and things like that that are used in schools these days are now offering their complete libraries for free online. So we actually downloaded a whole bunch of stuff about mathematics and things like that. And there's worksheets and fun things you can do at home to kind of go through with your kids and keep them busy when you're stuck at home with them also. How cool is that, huh? Fun stuff. I mean, the internet sometimes scares me, but then the internet is, is just blows me away. So the part that was actually kind of neat that I saw was, uh, not to talk about YouTube for a second, but the number one trending video is there's a band called, I think it's called the dropkick Murphys. I think is the name of it. Yeah. Their main concert got canceled for some reason. So they ended up doing their show, they set up some cameras and they recorded it and streamed it live for anybody to go see for free. So on St. Patrick's Day, here they are, instead of playing to an arena in the city they were in, instead they just did a concert for free for everybody. And it sounds like there's more and more artists that are going to be trying to do that over the next couple of weeks and months, which is, is kind of a neat thing. That is great. I love that. I watch uh, Stephen Colbert, uh, the late night with Stephen Colbert. Um, and he... Uh, they closed down the show. I mean, they didn't have an audience. They just had some of the people that work on the show in the audience. And it was like, it was such a different experience because you're just used to the, I mean, at least when I do my stand up comedy, I like to re work with the audience. Right. So, um, when does that start? Yeah. <laughs> and then the next one he did, he did from his house because everyone's supposed to stay home. And so he did it in the bathtub. He was wearing a suit in the bathtub with a bunch of bubble bubble bath. Is that what that's called? Bubble bath? Sure. It was a different experience. He he pulled it off, but um man, an audience really helps. I've I've done some public speaking and um I become a different person when I'm in front of an audience. So it's interesting. Very cool. Oh, there's some awkward silence there. No, I was sorry. I was looking at something. That's my fault again. I get distracted again. I was looking at the next one thinking like, okay, should we, what should we talk about here? The next one is one that I know nothing about because I'm not allowed to drink coffee in our house. <laughs> which <sure> is why. <laughs> oh, geez. I know. <laughs> By the way, I have committed, and I'll say this on the air to all of the Garden Fork folks, and hopefully my wife is not listening, but I am committing to try to break my soda habit over the next 30 days. Oh, that would be good for you. Yes, but uh, number 11 is run a half a pot of vinegar through your drip coffee maker. For some reason, I don't know why you need to do that. It doesn't make it taste any better, but sorry. <laughs> well, there are minerals that build up in the reservoir and the little tubing of your hot water. It's a hot water maker, basically, is what a coffee maker is. And that can build up and then clog up the plumbing, basically. And... Um, I don't know if it really sterilizes it, but white white vinegar is a very effective cleaner for some things. And it just feels like you're doing something right, you know? Let me ask you this. So those Keurig coffee makers are very, very popular these days. Are you supposed to run the vinegar through those also? I think so. I think those Keurig things are ecologically not great, I'll just say. Um I don't have one, so I don't know. But they are, again, just a hot water maker. After you run that vinegar through, you should run several, fill up the whole thing with water and, and run clear water through because you want to get that vinegar taste out of there before you make coffee uh, for your significant other. <laughs> Good to know. I'll make sure I do that beforehand so my missus doesn't come up to me and be like, what's wrong with the coffee maker? <laughs> Next How about this one? This one's an easy one. Drain your water heater. So a lot of times water heaters will have sludge build up, especially the ones with the tanks. If you have a tankless water heater, you don't have to do this. But if you have an older water heater in your house, turning off the system, um, flipping the levers on the top that turn off the water to feed it, and then drain the water out of it gets a lot of the stuff that kind of builds up on the bottom of your water heater, which impedes the ability for the heater to actually heat the, the water in there. And all you have to do is take a garden hose and either point it towards a drain or out a door or something like that, or even into a bucket if you needed to, and then turn that knob on the bottom of your water heater. Warning, the water will be very hot, so you know you might want to protect yourself a little bit. But ultimately, getting that gunk out of the bottom of your water heater will make your water heater last a lot longer. And a lot of people don't really think of it. They just think of that machine that sits downstairs and makes hot water, but never really 
do any maintenance to it. Yes, your uh, domestic water, I call it a hot water heater, and I get yelled at on YouTube for that. But it's basically a giant pasta pot with a burner on the bottom of it. And there is uh, water can cause the interior lining of your water heater to degrade, even though there's this rod called an anode rod rod in there, which you can replace also. Um, But that rust, that material that falls off the sides of the tank starts to build up at the bottom like sediment at the bottom of a a pool or something. And that inhibits the heating of the water and it degrades the tank even more. So at the way bottom of the tank is a valve that you can drain, which you have to be careful of. If it's a plastic valve, you have a less expensive water heater and it can be tricky to reclose that valve if there's a bunch of sediment that has gotten stuck in the valve. But what yep, you can you, do is you can just unscrew that valve and screw in a brass one and you're good to go. Those brass ones are pretty inexpensive too. I mean, it's not a 50 or $40 fix. It's probably less than $10 depending yeah. on which one you get. Let's say nine bucks. $9. Uh, next one on the list, pretty simple. If you have a house that has an attic, maybe put a ladder up, go up through the scuttle hole and just run a flashlight around and see if any new critters or anything is living in your attic. You know, sometimes you can look and see that, you know, a squirrel's got in there or bees or any of those types of things. And you want to double check to see if there's anything there or any issues or drips or things like that. Cause even just looking up there, I'm not suggesting crawling around in your attic, but just poking your head up there and taking a look around, you can definitely see if there's things happening, especially if you live in an area where they might have ice dams or those types of things that could damage your roof. Yeah, and you can see that if you're if you just have insulation laid into the bays, uh, you know, between the roof joists, basically, if that is not like a nice pink or yellow color, if it's black or gray, um, if it's blown in cellulose, it might be gray uh, b- by its manufacturer because it's paper. But um, pay attention to changes in color because that can suggest moisture. Or like a animal has been soiling there and um, you have a bigger problem. You could also have bats. So look up at the roof sheathing as well and see if there's any little friendly animals wedged up in there. That's always a a fun one, but it's an important one to do because you just want to make sure that that part of your house is also, you know, taken care of. If you have bats, uh, you need to call a, a licensed animal I can't remember what the word is, but basically someone who knows what they're doing. I mean, bats are very important in our ecosystem. So uh, don't just do something uncool with them. All right. So last two here, a simple one, Uh, lint trap on your dryer, clean it out and maybe clean out the port on the outside of your house. I know you've got some videos about taking care of your dryer and stuff, which are very helpful for folks. I am stunned. (laughs) I'll go to someone's house and they're like, you know, the dryer, it just doesn't dry very well. And all I do is pull out the regular lint thing that's on the top of the dryer. And it's, it, I can barely get it out of the slot. <laughs> it's just so full of stuff. Did I ever tell you, and I may have not said this one on the air or on the radio show, it may have been an after show beforehand, but when at the resort, there's a big commercial dryer and, you know, we're running and get halfway through the season. I'm just like, this thing just is not drying. People were complaining, hey, I put my dollar in there and I take my stuff out and it's still wet. And I opened up the compartment underneath. And then there's this door that you have to open to get the, the trap out. And I unscrewed the, the, the screws and it was so heavy. It fell, huh? landed on the ground. And this thing that looked like a pillow, like literally probably four inches thick by maybe 24 inches by 15 inches in size, slid on the ground and slid out from underneath there. It literally was four inches of lint that had built up in that thing over the last probably 10 years. Wow. I changed it out, and amazingly enough, it instantly worked better. Also, uh, the lint in the tube that goes from your dryer to the outside, if that builds up, it can be a fire hazard in addition to your dryer just not running very efficiently. So. An easy one on that one, too, is on the outside of your house, There's, if you have, let's say, vinyl siding, there's usually a little box with a flap that kind of opens and closes. You can just go outside, open up that flap, and a lot of times you can even reach in there and get all the stuff. As it gets closer to the end of the run, the temperature starts to drop, and then it can build up material at the end of the run as it's coming out of your house. And that's actually where most of the buildup happens, either in turns in the run, which 
most people don't have too many turns in it or at the very end of the run is where it actually starts building up the most. Yeah, and you can buy, essentially it's a flexible rod or it looks like a, a couple pieces of uh, metal cabling that have been twisted together. So it's like a springy, flexible thing with a, um, this is so technical, uh, with a with a flexible brush on the end and a hand on the other. And you can, by wrenching this thing around, you can get through almost the whole thing. You might have to take it apart. In one of my videos, I actually take the piping, the dryer vent exhaust pipe apart because it went up through these joists, but it makes such a huge difference. Do you want to hear the uh, easy life hack for this one? Sure. If you wanted to go cut the corner on the price, a toilet brush actually works really well. You take the cover off of the outside, put the toilet brush in your hand and reach in as far as you can and just kind of run it back and forth and pull everything out, then run your shop back in there and vacuum it out. And you can usually get a lot of the material out if it's a shorter run. Oh, that's excellent. That is excellent. Rinse well, out the toilet brush after you're done, by the way. Rinse it out because people will get angry in your house if you do that and you put it back and it's not clean. I'm just saying, not saying from experience, but maybe that did happen. <laughs> I will link to my dryer vent video, which was actually all shot on an iPhone. So those of you thinking you need big equipment to make YouTube videos, um, it was a spontaneous video and we shot the whole thing with an iPhone. So, Actually, that ties right into the number 15, which is spend some time watching Garden Fork and you can learn a whole bunch more about stuff you can do to your home. Exactly. That's it. Just watch Garden Fork. Don't do anything. That should be number one. It is surprising to watch what trends, uh, when, and um, it's it right now. It's like crockpot videos. Uh, the Instapot videos that I've seen online, there's a lot of people who are like, "Hey, I've had this thing for a while, and I'm going to start using it at my home since I'm going to be cooking at home a lot more." And uh, the number of people who are looking at that kind of stuff has definitely spiked also. You can make uh, no-knead bread with a slow cooker, and an Instant Pot is a slow cooker. So, yeah. Some Somebody told me that the new Instant Pot – so I'm a sous vide kind of guy. I've, I post a lot of stuff online about stuff that were sous vide, and someone told me that the newer Instant Pots within the last year have a setting for doing sous vide, so you might not even know you have a sous vide device in your house. It might be just sitting on your counter, and you might just not know what that button does. I actually bought the new Instant Pot because it had the sous vide setting. How does it work? Does it work pretty good? I haven't used it yet. I want to make a video. But uh, I have a friend who thrives on not buy anything new. They only want to buy things from a yard sale that are used. And they were like, I, will, I so badly want an Instant Pot, but I haven't found one at a garage sale. And I'm like, I'll sell you my old one. And so I sold him the old one for, I think, a third of the purchase price. But I was like, okay, now I get to buy the new one. <laughs> and I told you that the new one, there's an adapter to you can turn it into an air fryer also if you wanted to do that. Right. I am I am not enamored of the air fryer thing. but um, It's really just a convection oven. I mean, most ovens do the exact same thing as an air fryer. It's just air fryer because it's moving the air around the item and cooking at a high temperature. It just does it faster. Yeah. As I just wrecked that entire industry in one shot. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, everyone. If you have some ways to uh, um, stuff to do while you're stuck at home, let us know. It's radio at gardenfork.tv. We're going to do another show next week. Same kind of theme. Uh, just taking advantage of this uh, time at home and getting stuff done. I I was kind of feeling kind of bummed out the first couple of days that we had to do this. And then I went out in the woods and cut the, I cleaned up the trail with my chainsaw and my quad. And I'm like, Oh, Oh, I could do this. So sometimes you just got to get yourself out the door. And once you start going, uh, you fight that inertia and you're actually creating some momentum. So when I say go out and do cool stuff, that's really what I'm talking about. It's kind of neat, too, because once you get a couple things done, I don't want to say it charges you up to do the next thing. But, you know, even if you looked at this list and wrote a couple of the things down and you did them and then at the end of the day, you kind of looked at what you did around you, that sense of accomplishment really is a good thing for people, you know, just for their self being and everything else. I mean, I'm not here to be all woohoo, you know, uh, stuff about job. that. But uh, I would say that, I mean, 
if you have a list of five things and you get them done and you sit down to dinner and you think to yourself, look at all these things I accomplished today, even if they're small things, there's something beneficial about running that pencil through that item on that list and saying, yep, I got that one done and checking things off of the list as you do them. It, it makes you feel better. I, I honestly enjoy working at the resort, looking at the things that we do and the list helps you have direction. And then when you accomplish them, it feels really good to cross things off. I ordered uh, new brake shoes for my tractor. So that's going to be a video and something I can do while this time where we have to stay at home. Yeah, it's, you know, one of those times where if you have extra time on your hands, I know we all have busy lives and things going on and sometimes putting a moment of pause in and going out and, you know, doing things that might take a little bit extra time. There's there's a sense of accomplishment that comes along with it. And I can't recommend it enough. I feel much better having cleaned out the fridge because I, I can actually I actually found some things that I'm going to cook tonight. I'm like, oh, look at these potatoes. <laughs> I forgot about them. <laughs> That's what we're doing with the spices right now. Kind of like, hey, what can we do with this? Oh, I never knew these went together. And then all of a sudden now we have, I don't want to say new things that we have in the in the mix, but, you know, you kind of get in a, a, a rhythm of you kind of cook the same things over and over again because you're kind of comfortable with cooking them. And when you try new things, all of a sudden you're like, hey, that really tasted good. Yay. All right. So let us know your thoughts. It is radio at gardenfork.tv. Uh, you can find Will at the weekend homestead which is on youtube instagram and facebook and um will and i are going to hang out a little bit more we're going to have a little bit of an after after show for the garden fork patrons but thanks thanks so much for listening and uh i got a couple of really nice emails lately which i will read it the the i'll see if i don't know if they people want them to be read but it was very heartening to get those those emails i just want to say thank you very much for that so go out and do cool stuff you got the time now ready Let's go. Garden Fork Radio's executive producer is Jimmy Goots. You can find more information about Jimmy and the custom hollow books he makes at hollowbooks.com. Our theme music is used under license from uniquetracks.com. Other music used in the show is used under license from audioblocks.com. Thank you.